Questions orales, oral questions, the Honourable Opposition House Leader. U.S. President imposing tariffs on steel and aluminum should not have come as a surprise to anyone. The President first announced them back in March. He then exempted Canada in May and then again in June. Why in the world wasn't the Prime Minister ready to Im immediately impose retaliatory tariffs when the U.S. President imposed his on us? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, last week our government announced strong measures to defend Canadian steel and aluminum workers and the industry. This includes $16.6 .6 billion in reciprocal trade restriction measures against the U.S. goods, including U.S. steel and aluminum. This is the largest trade action that Canada has ever taken since the Second World War, and it's essential that we get it right. Over the next few days, we invite all Canadians to look at the list of proposed tariffs and provide feedback to help create the best possible retaliation list. Honourable Opposition House Leader. The, the Liberal government had months to, to pre prepare for this, and they did nothing. Steel and aluminum workers and their families are being hurt by these tariffs right now. But instead of having a plan ready to immediately deal with these punitive measures, the Liberals have been more focused on things like raising taxes on Canadians and giving billions of dollars to Texas oil companies. Talk about misplaced priorities. Will the government commit today that all monies collected from our ret retaliatory measures will go directly to those who are impacted by this trade war? Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure my honourable colleagues that we have the backs of our steel workers and our aluminum workers. We find that the decision made by the United States is totally accept unacceptable, and we have made that very, very clear. And to invoke national security uh, as the grounds on which to do it is absolutely preposterous. We will defend the interests of our aluminum and steel workers and our Canadian steel and aluminum industry. Honourable Opposition House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, one thing that would have helped is if we had ratified the CPTPP agreement. Mexico's ratified this agreement, and Japan is well on its way. But again, instead of passing CPTPP legislation, this Liberal government has been more focused on ramming through legislation, which will reduce penalties for terrorists, child molesters, and drunk drivers. Again, talk about misplaced priorities. Why are the Liberals taking so long to bring this free trade agreement into force? Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. CPTPP ratification is a top priority for our government, and we're working relentlessly in order to introduce the legislation before the House rises before the summer. CPTPP will provide unparalleled benefits for hardworking Canadians and their families. We have worked hard to improve the deal, and we have made real gains for the middle class, and we're now looking to work with all parliamentarians in this House on this important legislation. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Louis Saint Laurent. On this side of the House, we're in favor of the TPP, and that's why the first draft was signed. But the problem is that it still hasn't been implemented in Canada. So my question is very straightforward. How is it that the deal has been approved and signed, but hasn't been brought into force because the government is uh, dragging its heels and hasn't tabled legislation? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of our negotiations around the CPTPP, and we hope to make inroads in various areas like culture and intellectual property, as well as auto. And yesterday, the minister mentioned again in the House that we will table a bill to ratify this important deal, and we hope to have the support of all colleagues here in the House in order to proceed with ratification. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, the, with the tariffs on Canadian aluminum and steel, that's totally unacceptable. And last week, the government announced a number of countermeasures. My question for the government is quite straightforward. Will the there are all these workers in the Saguenay and elsewhere who will be affected by these tariffs. Will the government undertake to use whatever they collect in 
countervailing duties or tariffs to directly support affected workers. The Honourable Minister of Transport, Mr. Speaker, last week we announced strong measures to defend our workers in the steel and aluminum industries, and we are there for them, for our workers, for our steel and aluminum workers. Those are very important industries to Canada. We in no way will accept the U.S. decision especially because the reasons are absurd, using national security as an excuse. We are there to defend our steel and aluminum workers. We will stand up for them. The Honourable Member for Rimouski Nejet, Timiskwatali Basque. Mr. Speaker, this G7 meeting is an opportunity for the international community to make comparisons. And Canada's record isn't so good when it comes to the environment. The Liberals swore they would eliminate subsidies to the oil patch, and after three years in office, the Liberals and Canada still offers the highest subsidies to the oil patch of G7 countries. The Prime Minister will have an opportunity this week to rectify the situation. Will he announce at the G7 the elimination of these subsidies by 2020? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of what we're doing environmentally to deal with climate change, to address plastics pollution. The G7 is putting the priority on creating a charter on plastics. We're working very hard with all countries to ensure that we do what needs doing. We want to stop plastic from getting into our oceans. We have a huge problem. We'll do everything we can to put an end to it. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nejet Temiskwatale Basque. Well, that's voluntary self regulation. The Canada is giving the oil patch $1.5 billion a year in subsidies. That's $1.5 billion. And an environment champion, a leader, invests today to create green jobs for our workers and our children tomorrow. But the Prime Minister has lost all credibility as a climate change leader when he decides to buy a 65-year-old pipeline with $4.5 billion in public money. What concrete steps does the government plan to take at the G7 to redeem itself? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. We don't need to redeem ourselves because we have stood up for the environment. We have stood up for jobs. We're doing what needs to be done, what Canadians expect. We are addressing climate change. We are addressing the problem of plastic pollution, and we will also grow the economy. We have created 600,000 jobs. That's the greatest job growth Canadians have ever seen. We will continue doing that every day. I work hard every day to address climate change, to protect the environment. For North Island Powell River. The Prime Minister is more concerned with looking like a global climate leader to the other G7 leaders than actually being here one at home. Instead of eliminating subsidies for fossil fuels, the Prime Minister will now spend over $10 billion to build a new pipeline. Instead of keeping the promises to meet the Paris emissions targets, experts agree Liberals are nowhere near meeting their commitments. Here's a suggestion. How about the Prime Minister spend a little less time worrying about how he looks to world leaders and spend more time actually being a leader here? at home. Here, here. Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me explain what we're doing to tackle climate change here. We're putting a price on pollution across the country. Mr. Speaker, we are, uh, we are uh, investing a uh, historic investment That's in right. clean technologies. Here, here. We're, uh, we're phasing out coal. We're making right. historic investments in public transportation. Right. We're going to continue doing what we promised to Canadians, which is meeting our international agreements, and we're going to continue pushing abroad. You can do both. You can talk and chew gum at the same time, and that's what we're going to do. Honourable Member for North Island Powell River. Order. Well, Mr. Speaker, do you remember Kyoto, the Kyoto Protocol? Because I, I certainly do. Yeah. That was the climate change agreement that the oh, yeah. previous Liberal government signed and then completely abandoned. Later, Liberal insiders say they ratified it purely as a PR stunt, and they never had any intention to act on it. Now the Environment Commissioner is saying the government is nowhere near meeting the Paris targets. I, for one, am getting completely tired of these sequels, Mr. Speaker. So Canadians want to know and deserve to know, is this just another Liberal PR stunt? The Honourable Minister of Environment. 
Let me explain again what we're doing. We spent one year working with the provinces and territories to come up with the first ever serious plan to tackle climate change and to meet our international agreements. After a decade of inaction under the previous government, we have stepped up. We're putting a price on pollution. We're phasing out coal, making historic investments in public transportation. In Ottawa, LRT, our investments in LRT with the largest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in, the, in our city's history. We're investing in clean technology. We understand that we need to do it for our Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, I'd, be, I'd like to begin by thanking the Environment Minister for pointing out the funds that John Baird and I secured for the local transit project. Yeah, 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 yeah. They'd, be well, they'd be well served if they followed our, uh, our, our approach to taxes as well. Uh, during our government, they went down, particularly for modest and low-income people. Under this Liberal government, Taxes have gone up for 81 per cent of middle-class taxpayers. So how much will this carbon tax cost the average Canadian family? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was very pleased that we announced the funding for the second phase of LRT in Ottawa. I'm actually happy when we work across party lines. I would really be happy if across party lines we would tackle climate change because we owe it to our kids and there's a huge economic opportunity. I fail to understand why the party opposite won't take serious action on climate change, won't take serious the fact that our kids and grandkids will hold us responsible and they're missing out on the $23 trillion opportunity of clean growth. Here, here, here. Carlton. Well, I was very pleased to uh, watch John Baird announce the first phase of Ottawa's light rail, and I was very pleased to also announce the second phase myself. And I was actually flattered to see her re-announce that second phase a year after we did it. But, She could follow our approach on taxes, which was to put more money in the pockets, particularly of low- and middle-income taxpayers. Can she tell us today how much will her carbon tax cost the average Canadian family? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure. Order. Mr. Speaker. Order. I'm afraid I have to remind honourable members, like the member for Banff Airdrie and others, that each side gets its turn. I think they know each side gets its turn. And I'd ask them to listen when the other side has its turn. The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, the, the previous government had a very bad habit of making announcements without even knowing where the money is going to come from. That's exactly what they did for transit investment in, in, in Ontario and Ottawa, without even knowing having any money in the budget. What we have done, Mr. Speaker, put forward $25 billion investment into public transit, under which we are funding the Ottawa as a second phase, because we know what the So quiet earlier. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, uh, funding for both phases of the Ottawa Transit were provided under the previous Conservative government, and they were set aside within the budget framework, within the context of a balanced budget. Twice what they promised. Taxes are up on 80% of middle class taxpayers. Another broken promise. Before they break a third broken prom make a third broken promise in a row, will they tell us how much will the average Canadian family spend on this car? The Honourable Minister of Environment. 
once again, I would like to repeat that the second phase of LT, there was no money. Uh, we were the ones who actually made the commitment to invest in public transit. And we know that climate change is real. We know that it has a real cost, and we know there's a huge opportunity, economic growth, and jobs. We're very proud that we're taking action on climate change, and I would like to ask the uh, other side. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know what the Conservative Party's plan is to tackle climate change. The Honourable... The Honourable Member for Carleton. Order. Well, one successful part of the plan that actually saw greenhouse gases go down under the previous government was a public transit tax credit that gave savings to people who made responsible decisions to get on public transit and protect the environment, but they raised taxes on those same environmentally conscious passengers on our public transit. It was one of many tax increases that have led to an $800 tax increase on the average middle-class family. How much more will those families pay under the new Liberal carbon tax? Order. I'd ask members, including the member for Niagara Centre, not to be interrupting when someone else has the floor. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting to hear the member opposite on today, uh, on this day, announcing that he supports what the Ontario Liberal government did, uh, which is which is actually phase out coal. That was the biggest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions right. uh, in our country's history. That we know we need to take serious action on climate change by phasing out coal, putting a price on pollution, making investments in clean technology. But once again, everyone wants to know. That's totally inappropriate. Order. I don't think members want to live in a place where you can't hear other points of view. I don't think anyone believes that in this, in this house. And now that we're all in a good mood, the Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. Mr. Speaker, Quebec's dairy, egg and poultry producers are extremely concerned about what the Prime Minister said on NBC. When he meets with Quebec farmers, he says he defends supply management, but when he crosses the border, he says precisely the opposite. Canada is flexible on supply management. Mr. Speaker, in Quebec alone, over 6,000 family farms depend on it. Can the Prime Minister tell us, yes or no, if he has already traded away market access to the U.S. to protect what remains of supply management? The Honourable Minister of International Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, our government is firmly resolved to protect supply management. The Prime Minister, the Foreign Affairs Minister, the Agriculture Minister, the 41 Quebec members, all members in the Liberal Party support and believe in our supply management system. And I guarantee that we will protect supply management. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Perhaps the minister should speak to the prime minister because he was very clear on NBC. He said he was going to show or has already been flexible, we don't know, when it comes to supply management. Simon Beauchemin, a close advisor to the prime minister, is clearly in favor of making concessions on supply management. So I have one simple question. Do the Liberals plan to fully protect not just protect, but fully protect supply management without further concessions, yes or no? The Honourable Minister of International Development. Mr. Speaker, once again, our government is firmly resolved to protect the supply management system. The 41 members from uh, Quebec, as well as all Liberals, believe in supply management. The Minister, the Prime Minister, the uh, we are all protecting it. The, our friends opposite do not agree. They appointed a critic who's completely against supply management. The member for Bose was made the shadow minister for economic development, Mr. Speaker. The honorable member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, sometimes it's surprising what you see in 
party platforms. For example, we will end handouts to the oil patch. That was on page 40 of the Liberal platform. Pretty surprising, eh? And over three years later, the Liberals have still done nothing. We're the worst of the G7, worse than Donald Trump. So my question for the Environment Minister is straightforward. How much was given in subsidies to oil companies last year? Obviously, the answer has to be a number. Don't just say it's a lot. A number. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Inefficient fuel subsidies is a G20 commitment. Canada is part of that commitment, and we have already taken significant steps in Budget 2016 and Budget 2017, and we will continue to do that, as is our international commitment and what we believe is good for the Canadian economy. Now, remember for Skina Balfley Valley. No, you know why they can't answer how much, Mr. Speaker? It's because they don't know. <laughs> Yet a report out today shows that Canada ranks dead last in the G7. Imagine the irony. As devoted as Donald Trump is to the oil and gas sector, he has to tip his little red cap to these Liberals because they're even worse. Then these climate champions went out and bought a 65-year-old leaky pipeline for $4.5 billion of our money. So let's do some Liberal multiple choice. Was that money A, a bailout, B, a subsidy, C, a really dumb idea, or D, all of the above? All of the above. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, none of the above. And none of the above because Canadians who care about the future of the oil and gas industry as part of a strategy for the Canadian economy know that to be competitive we want to expand our export markets rather than sending 99% of oil and gas exports to one country, the United States, we are opening up export markets. And that's only part of why this pipeline is good for Canada. It's good for Indigenous peoples. It's good for the environment, too, because of a billion and a half dollars. In the Honourable Member for Calgary, Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has been telling Canadians it will cost them $4.5 billion to buy the old Trans Mountain Pipeline. Today we've learned that this is not actually the final price. It may cost Canadians much more, and that's without a single inch of new pipeline being built. When will the Prime Minister quit hiding what his failures are really going to cost taxpayers? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, the failure was the inability of the Harper government to build one kilometre of pipe to new markets. That was a failure. They had 10 years to do it, and they couldn't. And the reason they couldn't was because they refused to understand that investments in the environment enable us to build infrastructure. And we on this side of the House are very proud of our ability to both, at the same time, create jobs and protect the environment. Yeah. Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister claimed that the cost of the pipeline would be $4.5 billion. We now know that that's not true. It's just a guess. Canadians could be on the hook for a lot more than $4.5 billion for the existing pipeline, never mind the construction costs for the new pipeline. So when will the Liberals come clean and tell Canadians how much it's going to cost. Here, here. Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. I know that the Honourable Member and the Conservative Party believe that this is a commercially viable project because they have been promoting this project from the first day we took our seats in the House of Commons, promoting it every day, aggressively, unwaveringly. But now, because we've done what they couldn't do. They don't know where to go with this. We know where we're going. We're going to get the pipeline built, and we're going to protect the environment, and we're going to consult Indigenous peoples. Order the Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Mr. Speaker, last year, foreign direct investment in this country was the lowest in over a decade. And nowhere is, it, is that 
disaster more real than in Alberta. Tens of billions of dollars of, of potential oil and gas projects are being scrapped. Massive divestments by international oil producers. The Prime Minister's answer to this disaster, a buyout and drive out of Kinder Morgan. Wow. When will the minister quit attacking Wrong. the industry so that it can begin the process of recovery and rebuild investor confidence? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, when is the honourable member going to stop badmouthing the economy of Alberta? Yeah. Now, let me give you an example. Employment is up 3.5 per cent. Earnings are up 6.9 per cent. Wholesale trade is up 16.3 per cent. Manufacturing is up 25.5 per cent. Exports are up 46.5 per cent. We believe in the people of Alberta. The Honourable Member for Calgary Shepherd. Order. Investment in Canada's energy industry increased nine out of ten years under the previous Conservative government. Right. And today, We've hit a decade low, $100 billion in losses and major divestments from exactly. Royal Dutch Shell right. and right. ConocoPhillips totaling nearly $30 billion. Exactly. Now Kinder Morgan is fleeing Canada in the face of the Liberal plan to phase out our oil sands. Canadian energy investors are now creating a record number of new jobs outside here, here. of Canada as the Liberals block energy projects at home with investment at record lows and energy jobs fleeing Canada. Why does the Natural Resources Minister keep pretending that this is the best thing The Honourable yeah. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Merci. Le Canada n'a jamais été au... Canada has never been a, such a good place to invest in as it is now. We're creating a climate that's predictable and stable for investment and trade. Foreign investors see Canada as an open, safe uh, place with highly skilled workers. That's the Canada of today, and we are ensuring that investors of the entire world see it as an attractive place to invest. Mr. Speaker, while the Prime Minister is asking leaders to commit to zero waste plastics at the G7, hosted by this government, the meeting won't even be a zero plastic waste event. Canadians from coast to coast are calling on the Liberals to protect our oceans and ban single use plastics here at home. Tomorrow is World Oceans Day, and Canadians know we need action to combat plastic pollution in our waterways now. The Liberals have said they know that this is a critical problem. So when will they finally do something about it? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I absolutely agree with the member opposite that we've got a huge problem. Can you imagine by 2050, if we don't take action, we're going to have more plastic waste in our ocean by weight than fish, that every minute we're dumping the equivalent of a dump truck of plastic waste into the oceans, and that this single-use plastic that we're throwing out has a value of between $100 and $150 billion? We need to do better. We're pushing a plastic waste charter uh, in the G7 context. We're also developing a national strategy for plastics in Canada, and we're seeing in Canada right. that municipalities are stepping up. Municipalities like Vancouver, like Montreal, Bertie. The Honourable Member for Bertie Masquinonger. Mr. Speaker, oh, in Canada, the Liberals say that they'll stand up for supply management, but in the United States, the Prime Minister says he'll be flexible. A real leader is someone who stands up for dairy producers in Canada. He's someone, it's someone who keeps his promises, who's willing to say to G7 members, I will defend our entire supply management system without any concessions. Is there anyone in this House besides the NDP who's willing to protect the entire supply management system. Zero concessions, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister for International De Development. Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that our government and this entire caucus is committed to defending supply management. The Prime Minister, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of Agriculture and the 41 Quebec members. We are unanimous on the supply management system, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For Tobik Mactaquack. Mr. Speaker, for residents in my riding of Tobik Mactaquack, CBC Radio Canada is an essential part of their lives, providing them with local news, Canadian stories, and high quality Canadian products. 
news, new We all remember the Harper government's cuts to CBC Radio Canada. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage tell this House what our government is doing to ensure that our public broadcaster remains strong? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. I'd like to thank my colleague from Tobik Matakwak for his question. More than ever, the government believes in the importance of our public broadcaster. And when we're speaking of Radio Canada, one can only remember the heritage of the Conservatives. We're at war with them, and they did everything to weaken our public broadcaster. That's their record. Our record is reinvesting $675 million, appointing a CEO from the sector, and a first woman ahead of this very important institution. We will make sure that the Harper Conservatives, what they did, never happens again because they would if given the chance. Thank you. The Honourable Deputy... The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, saint charles Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Public Sa Safety has said loud and clear that Canadians shouldn't worry about 30,000 illegal entries into Canada. He's telling us that everything is under control. But you know what the Canada Border Services agents told us? They've had to reduce their security screening from 8 to 2 hours, and 10 to 15 percent of illegals do not come back for their second interview. In fact, we don't even know where they are. Why is the Prime Minister refusing to raise this issue at the G7? Mr. Speaker, our government remains unwavering in our commitment to protect the safety of Canadians and to keep our borders secure. Irregular border crossers, border crossers are thoroughly screened and they do not get a free ticket to remain in Canada. And in fact, the budget included $173 million to support security operations at the Canada-U.S. border and to ensure that we can continue to securely and effectively process asylum seekers. We're continuing to ensure that Canadian law is applied and that our international obligations are respected. Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles well, once again, words that are meaningless, Mr. Speaker. Now, in terms of the Minister of Immigration, the Minister of Immigration appears to have organized a plan so that everything is easy. He gave $50 million to divide up between three provinces, so they'll be quiet. He's built costly facilities in saint bernard de la Colle to receive illegals. And there's a transportation service to bring illegals to a community of their choice. Yes, a community of their choice. So the minister gives nice speeches, but his actions confirm his hypocrisy and his lack of sincerity. Where is the minister's plan? Order. I must remind the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles, that under the standing orders, one cannot indicate the presence or absence of a member in the House. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, really? My colleague keeps saying foolish things every single day about immigrants. We have established a plan that is solid. We've done this in collaboration with the provinces so that we have a proper uh, screening and triage system. We've started these consultations with the provinces, and I would like my colleague opposite to be more constructive and less negative in his questions about asylum seekers, because we are all working together on this important issue. Member for Selkirk, Interlake, Eastman. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have no plan, and the Prime Minister is failing our Canadian Armed Forces. This week we learned that things are so bad that our soldiers are being ordered to return their rucksacks and their sleeping bags to be used by others. And now we've learned that the cost of building the joint supply ships have skyrocketed another billion dollars over budget, and they're not going to take the first delivery until probably sometime in 2023. So how can Canadians trust this Prime Minister to deliver on Navy ships when he can't even buy enough sleeping bags for our troops? <laughs> The parliamentary secretary to the Minister of National Defence. It's the Conservatives who did not support defence. We are making sure that the Canadian Armed Forces have the necessary equipment and training to perform the important missions they are entrusted with. Canadian Armed Forces redistribute equipment to ensure that all our members have the equipment they need when they need it. 
We have been successfully recruiting and we've been reinforcing our reserves. And these new recruits will need more equipment, need more equipment, and we'll need equipment from those who moved on to other positions. Perry Sound, Muskoka. Well, Mr. Speaker, these partisan attacks actually don't change the facts on the ground. Actually, we are proud of our procurement record, which includes five C-17 Globemasters, 17 C-130 Hercules, five Chinook, uh, 15 Chinook helicopters, and we initiated the contract for the Asterix interim supply ship, which, by the way, was on time and on budget, despite the best efforts of the Liberal to kill that deal. We'll put our record against their record any day of the week, Mr. Speaker. How is it possible for these incompetent Liberals to mess it up so badly when it comes to military procurement? Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Mr. Speaker, we are very proud that we are getting ships built and we are getting fighter jets for our troops. We know that our armed forces desperately need the equipment to do the really difficult jobs we ask of them. We have plans we will have. We have a ship that's already built. We have ships that will be built by the end of this year. We are delivering our, our fighter jet interim fleet starting the beginning of next year. We'll take no lessons from the Conservatives on how to do defence procurement. Honourable Member for Kootenay, Columbia. Government has begun negotiations with the United States on the future of the 54-year-old Columbia River Treaty. During the original negotiations, more than 2,000 people were forced to relocate as rich farmland and valuable riparian areas were sacrificed, and Indigenous people did not have their voices heard at all. Now it's 2018, and despite the government's promises for a new relationship with First Nations, mm -hmm. they are not being offered a seat at the table. Will the government take immediate action to ensure that First Nations are at the table for the renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for Canada-U.S. Relations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our objective in these negotiations is to ensure that the Columbia River Treaty continues to be mutually beneficial for Canada, the United States, and the Indigenous groups involved in the area. We've been working closely with British Columbia, First Nations, and stakeholders to ensure that all interests are heard and articulated. We will also address the environmental issues that they've raised and the interests of the First Nations, and the aim is to renew this agreement well into the 21st century. And we're going to work hard to ensure that benefits are optimized for Canada, British Columbia, First Nations, and the local communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Saskatoon West. Mr. Speaker, 96 per cent of Canadian workers in construction and the skilled trades are potentially exposed to asbestos in the workplace. We have known that asbestos is a carcinogen for over 30 years and that the toxic fibres are, are a leading cause of workplace-related death in Canada. Despite the announced ban, there is no national standard for testing, handling and removal of this killer substance. Mr. Speaker, will this government implement a comprehensive strategy for asbestos removal to protect all workers and all Canadians? Thank you. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Employment. Mr. Speaker, uh, in fact, uh, the member would know that uh, this government has uh, deemed that asbestos is uh, out of uh, the realm of our trade. Uh, we are working with all stakeholders. Uh, there was a, a, a me meeting held recently here in Ottawa uh, that brought all stakeholders together, um, labour, health leaders, and uh, that strategy is absolutely under construction, and uh, we'll be looking forward to tabling something very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Mr. Speaker, with summer upon us, Canadians are gearing up to head out to the great outdoors, and it appears they're better equipped than our Canadian Armed Forces. <laughs> Thanks to the, this Prime Minister's failure of leadership, our troops exactly now right. face a shortfall of equipment when it comes to sleeping bags. How can the Prime Minister justify deploying our troops to a war zone in Mali when he can't even outfit our troops for a trip to cottage country? <laughs> the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Our government is determined to provide the Canadian Armed Forces with the equipment, the training and support that they need to allow our men and women in uniform to accomplish their important missions here and abroad. Protection and security and engagement is our motto, as well as good training and good equipment so that they can 
fulfill their, fulfill their missions. After so many years of cuts by the previous government, we are determined to better equip and prepare our men and women in uniform. For Bruce Gray Own Sound. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals continue their attack on Canadian farmers and the Canadian agricultural industry. First, it was a new Canada food guide in front of package labeling calling milk and meat products unhealthy. Now they are attacking feed distributors. Liberals are eliminating the ability for retail stores like feed stores and farm supply outlets to sell feed mixed with antibiotics in any form to anyone. These businesses have sold these products to farmers safety, safely and effectively for years. When will the Liberals stop their attacks on Canadian agriculture? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll assure my honourable colleague what we have done has been a major asset to the Canadian agricultural sector. As my honourable colleague is well aware, his government, the former Harper government, cut about close to $700 million from the agricultural sector. And we will make sure that farmers have the seed that they need, but my honourable colleague is fully aware that seed it has to be certified. I think my honourable colleague is well aware of that. Uh, the yeah, member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Honor out of my, or the answer out of my good friend across here. My hair will be uh, white and falling out before I get a straight answer. <laughs> Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Sp Mr. Speaker, these new regulations will become effective in December of this year. There's still time for these Liberals to do the right thing and cancel these changes. Farm supply and feed stores are an essential aspect in the delivery of feed to farms across Canada. These businesses are the lifeblood, as he should know, of, it, of many rural communities. These changes will take away their ability right. to sell products that they've been selling without any issue for generations. Enough. Far too much talk of hair, for sure. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my Honourable Colleague's question, but I can't do a thing about his hair. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I can tell him one thing we will do is make sure the agriculture and agri-food sector is supported by the government. We will make sure we have science. We will also make sure that the CFIA will always make sure that any seed that is permitted to be planted in this country will be certified. I am sure my honourable colleague has never indicated that the regulatory process should be jeopardized. The honourable member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, the government's public transit infrastructure investments are building stronger communities across Canada, including in my riding of Davenport. These investments are much needed and are critical to ensuring that commuters can get to work, school and appointments, both quickly, safely and in an environmentally friendly way. Can the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities please update this House on the public transit investments the government is making in Toronto? Oh, good. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for Devonport for her advocacy on this file. We know that investing in public transit is a shared responsibility. That is why we are investing more than $934 million for the purchase of more than 1,000 new buses for the TTC, as well as the repairing of hundreds of old buses. This investment will enhance transit services for millions of commuters across Toronto. Investing in public transit is an integral part of our government's efforts to grow the economy and build a strong the Honourable Member for Lévis Lapinière. Mr. Speaker, as if it weren't enough to make taxpayers pay $8 million to build a fancy rink, now we're learning that the Minister of Heritage re-offended in her mad spending sprees by refusing to listen to her officials on a stopover in Seoul that had nothing to do with the purposes of the trade mission in China. Mr. Speaker, how much did, once again, the whims of the Minister of Heritage spend in Seoul just to get us to dance K-pop? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Well, clearly my colleague should join the uni uh, Artists' Union because he's talented. What we did as a government was decide to reinvest in the arts sector when they massively cut in the cultural sector. 
What we also did was reinvest $125 million in a cultural export strategy that is absolutely necessary because we know that this represents growth here and jobs. We know that we can export our culture throughout the world, and we will continue to support our artists. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After having wildly, widely consulted, the committee conducting a review of rail safety legislation tabled its report. Several recommendations require immediate action on the part of the minister. As a response, the minister is proposing what? wait for it, a round table to consult the stakeholders who participated in the first consultations to find out what they think about the consultations and what they think about the report that came out of these consultations. Seriously? Will the minister take responsibility? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Well, I'd like to thank my colleague because this gives me an opportunity to thank the three individuals who did excellent work in reviewing the, trans the Rail Safety Transportation Act. And I am so proud that we delivered this report one year earlier than planned. Now, of course, my NDP colleague must be aware of the fact that we're not like the Conservatives. We believe that it is important to consult. We will do that until we feel that the Canadian public has been suitably consulted, and then we will make our decisions based on that. Order. Hello. Hello. Order. The Honourable Member for Marc Aurel Fortin. Mr. Speaker, our government proudly unveiled its new defence policy one year ago today. Strong, secure, engaged is an ambitious and realistic policy that will equip our Canadian Armed Forces to face today's and tomorrow's challenges. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence tell this House about the numerous achievements under our new defence policy one year after its announcement? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, I'd like to thank the member for Marc Aurel Fortin for his question. We have worked very hard in drafting an ambitious and realistic policy. We consulted Canadians widely who, widely, who told us that they wanted the well-being of the men and women in uniform to be taken care of, as well as their families. Contrary to the Conservatives, we increased defence spending by 70 per cent over the next 10 years in order to to ensure Canada's protection, safety of North America, and our involvement worldwide. That's Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, the Palestinian ambassador to France acknowledged recently, quote, Iran is fully financing and pushing the Hamas demonstration, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, Iran is spreading violence and terror throughout the region, determined to force other peoples to attack Israel. This government has said that they are a friend to Israel, even while they are singling Israel out for criticism. But will they be as tough on Iran? Will they call for an independent investigation into Iran's role in instigating this violence? Will they? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. First of all, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows full well that it has been the long-standing position of consecutive governments, both Conservative and Liberal, here in Canada that we are an ally and friend of Israel and friend to the Palestinian people. We absolutely deplore the actions of Hamas and its incitement to violence. It has been designated as a terrorist organization in this country since 2002, and this government maintains the position and abhors the actions that Hamas takes. We are also extremely troubled by the situation that recently occurred in Gaza, and we have called for an independent investigation. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, gas prices in Quebec is getting close to $1.50 a litre. The consumer is the one who is filling up, and it's the consumer who is being pumped dry. On the 29th of May, the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources in Quebec, Pierre Moreau, put a question to the Minister of Economic Development, and I'm passing on his question. Does the minister plan on taking further action to ensure that the gasoline market is fair, efficient, and competitive? Can we have an answer? 
Honorable Minister of Economic Development, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, I do not agree what my colleague has said. We have a very good process. Have is actually uh, being led by the Competition Bureau, which actually enforces the Competition Act, and they look at price fixing, price maintenance, and the abuse of dominance in the market with respect to gasoline prices. The Bureau in the past has made investigations. 39 individuals and 15 companies were charged for their role in a gasoline price fixing conspiracy in four local markets in Quebec, Mr. Speaker, will continue to monitor the situation, and I'm confident in the Competition Bureau's work. Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes, Verchères. Mr. Speaker, all year long, the Canadian government sacrifices Quebec, but when by-elections come up, magic happens. On May 25th, the Liberal member for Lac Saint-Jean announced $700,000 for businesses in Saguenay. I imagine they won't be counting that as part of their election expenses. The problem is not the investment, it's the timing that's absolutely unacceptable. Did this government attempt to influence the outcome of the by-elections in Chukwutsimi with public money? The Honourable Minister for Democratic Institutions. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows, we introduced a C-76 that introduces a pre-election period. And as a government, we have also made commitments because the government cannot do advertising 90 days before general elections. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, buying the 65-year-old Trans Mountain Pipeline from Kinder Morgan shows the kind of brilliant business acumen of buying up all the blockbuster assets while Netflix takes off. I I'm wondering when we will see the contract of sale. We know there's apparently 121 pages of fine legalese that could help us stop this sale before it's closing in August. I wonder when the contract will be made public. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Mr. Speaker, uh, the Trans Mountain Expansion Project has significant commercial value, and this transaction represents a sound investment opportunity for Canada. With that said, the transaction to purchase these assets will close later this summer, and we will make more information available as appropriate. But also, the Honourable Member knows that we have invested $100 million in smart grids, $182 million in energy efficiency buildings, another $182 in electric vehicles, a $2 billion low-carbon fund. The list goes on and on. The Honourable Member for charlebourg haute saint charles on a point of order, Mr. Speaker. In response to my second question, the Minister